All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had uh, a good night's sleep after yesterday's uh, dinner. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first keynote speaker, uh, sorry, the, the keynote speaker of the day, the first speaker of the day or two, which is Thomas Jungwirth from the um, Czech Academy of Science. And uh, we will talk about from spintronics and antiferromagnets to emerging magnetic phase, which we heard already a little bit about from, from Jairo the other days. But uh, without falling, I'll give you the word and looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction and invitation and uh, uh, to everybody uh, coming to uh, today's morning sessions after the uh, wonderful dinner yesterday. So what I'm going to try to do today is to uh, walk you from uh, spintronics and antiferromagnets towards this uh, emerging uh, unconventional phase in magnets that we uh, uh, start calling ultramagnets. And b before I start, uh, I have to acknowledge <coughs> uh, many collaborators that have uh, been working on this topic, in particular on the uh, emerging ultramagnetic phase over the past COVID two years. Uh, uh, first of all, Libor Schmeikal, who has been the key uh, person in the research, but there's also uh, a few people uh, on the list that uh, are or, or have been at this conference. You probably know Jairo Sinova, uh, and uh, you heard uh, on Monday a talk by Helena Reichlova on the topic. So uh, uh, let's me, let me first, on the first two slides, just a warm up, uh, remind us uh, why we are interested in compensated magnets uh, uh, in contrast to the uncompensated ferromagnets. And there's been uh, many talks in this conference. I heard a few uh, yesterday uh, that uh, these compensated magnets are studied uh, in the context of the energy and time downscaling of, of spintronic devices, and I'm definitely not gonna go through all the wonderful experiments that have been done, but let me just highlight two that I uh, find, uh, two areas that I find remarkable. And one area is represented by this uh, experiment uh, by uh, uh, Alexei Kimel's group and also by uh, Rupert Huber's group in, in Regensburg, where they, what they achieved is uh, they took a compensated uh, 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 orthoferrite oxide, and they demonstrated switching of this uh, material <laughs> by energies that correspond to a single picosecond long uh, uh, terahertz photon per magnetic atom in the lattice. And why uh, they and many people and, and myself find this uh, remarkable is that uh, a single photon energy correspond to this uh, <coughs> Uh, KBT log 2 at room temperature energy scale or dissipation scale, uh, which is the thermodynamic limit for operating digital bits in today's computers, uh, which are uh, based on irreversible operations. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when you are able to switch it with a terahertz photon, you can also uh, limit your time scale uh, of the pulse down to picoseconds, so you can also achieve a very fast, ultra-fast switching. But to be able to do that, you need to have a material that is able to react uh, to the external stimuli at this ultra short time scales. And here, the compensated magnets uh, with their internal uh, frequencies in the terahertz range are uh, more favorable than ferromagnets whose uh, ferromagnetic resonance frequencies are in the gigahertz range. So that's one area that's uh, with the vision of the ultra fast, ultra low energy digital. Uh, computing and the uh, <coughs> completely complementary uh, direction of research, but also motivated by energy and time downscaling, is to move from digital computers to the brain like analog uh, devices which can combine uh, logic and memory functionality in one and the same <coughs> element. And here, uh, uh, this area of uh, antiferromagnetic spintronic research has been uh, uh, pioneered by the group of uh, Hideo Ono and uh, Shunsuke Fukami, who I believe also gave a talk here at this conference uh, earlier. And uh, they focused on metallic antiferromagnets because uh, they are compatible uh, with the metallic spintronics these uh, people are experts on. 
and they demonstrated uh, devices which showed this analog lodging in memory by doing electrical switching and electrical readout. <coughs> Now, we've been also interested in this area, also used a metallic antiferromagnet, copper manganese arsenide, in collaborations with many teams, in particular with the team of Tobias Kamfrat in Berlin, who has a terahertz lab, and uh, demonstrated that you can have devices which show this analog logic in memory functionality, but also in combination with addressing those devices by uh, terahertz, uh, uh, ultra short terahertz pulses. <clears throat> So if you want, uh, these type of experiments bridge these two uh, uh, very complementary but very distinct areas of uh, research of compensated magnets uh, with the aim of uh, exploring the energy and time downscaling. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go into the details of these experiments, and there were many other experiments uh, motivated by uh, these ideas. <laughs> Just want to highlight that the key that people understand is for the success is that we are working with compensated order of spins in our materials. Uh, that means order which has uh, no net magnetization. <clears throat> now, <coughs> uh, you guys also had this uh, uh, wonderful uh, lecture by Albert Ferd uh, uh, to open this, uh, this meeting. And uh, <coughs> Albert Ferd is uh, one of the pioneers of uh, the field of ferromagnetic spintronics. And so terahertz spintronics and neuromorphic spintronics might be wonderful visions for the far future, but uh, we know that currently there are viable uh, spintronic devices which are very successful also commercially, uh, but those devices are based on ferromagnets. And there is a very good reason why uh, uh, these devices are based on ferromagnets, and the reason is that they, uh, for their functionality, whether it's the readout by giant magneto resistance or tunneling magneto resistance or spin transfer torque, they rely on the fact that uh, carriers uh, not only carry electrical charge uh, in these devices, but they also carry ordered, uh, if you want, polarized spin information. <clears throat> and uh, in ferromagnets, we know exactly why this is possible. It's possible because we have spin order in the direct physical space. We have magnetic atoms with their spins aligned in the same ferromagnetic fashion. <clears throat> and because of this, uh, these crystals have a large uh, net magnetization. And because of this large net magnetization, you do have a counterpart spin order in the reciprocal momentum space if you look, for example, at the Fermi surfaces here. <clears throat> So you have a majority spin Fermi surface and you have a minority spin Fermi surface. So once you start uh, running electrical current uh, through your devices, uh, you will have uh, the electrical current carried primarily by the majority spins and that gives it the spin polarization. So uh, now let's take a look at uh, uh, these antiferromagnetic crystals. We said that we like them uh, maybe with the vision of terahertz or neomorphics because of uh, uh, their no net magnetization. But that uh, creates a major problem. Uh, antiferromagnets do have spin order in the direct physical space. This is analogous to ferromagnets. But that uh, spin order in the direct phase is different in a way that it's staggered. So the spins, uh, when we go from one to the neighboring atomic site, they uh, flip sign or they change their uh, orientation. <clears throat> As a result, there is no net magnetization, and as a result, when we go to the reciprocal space, in the momentum space, when we look at the Fermi surfaces, they are principally indistinguishable, at least the first sight, from ordinary paramagnets. There is no spin order in the reciprocal space, so you do not have functionalities like this. You cannot just simply generate spin polarized currents, have giant magneto resistance, tunneling magneto resistance, spin torque phenomena. Uh, yet, over the past uh, half decade plus, uh, there has been a thriving field of uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics where people are demonstrating uh, various ways how you can uh, electrically or optically read or write information in antiferromagnets. But what I like to emphasize here that in all these studies, uh, what we were doing was circumventing this problem. We fully realized that this is a fact. Uh, the band structure or uh, the reciprocal space contains no information about the spin uh, order here, so we do not have the spin polarized currents. So if we want to do functionalities, we need to somehow circumvent the problem. And there have been many different ways, and again, I'm going to not go through these uh, phenomena, but uh, they've been, uh, most of them, quite elaborate, and most of them relying on relativistic spin orbit interactions. 
while uh, the strength of the giant magneto resistance and spin transfer torque is that these are principally non-relativistic effects. That means they are principally strong, while relativistic effects typically tend to be significantly weaker. <clears throat> so uh, today, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the various beautiful works that have been done uh, around the world of circumventing the problem with antiferromagnets. What I'd like to do today is to show you uh, <coughs> uh, uh, a way how to solve the problem. And uh, first, I'd like to highlight that uh, there's been, over the past maybe two, three years, uh, 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 several reports uh, that showed either implicitly or explicitly hints uh, towards the solution of the problem. Uh, we worked on this uh, for a few years, but there's been also groups in, uh, uh, elsewhere in Europe, also in the States and in Japan. <clears throat> And uh, uh, over the past two years, we've been uh, uh, working on this towards not having scattered uh, um, demonstrations, scattered materials, but really developing a systematic, rigorous, and general uh, understanding of how to uh, solve, not circumvent, and how to solve the problem. So this is going to be the topic of uh, my today's talk. But before I get to this systematic, rigorous, general uh, understanding and solution of the problem, let me just start with showing a simplest uh, model representation of the solution on a, on a cartoon level. <clears throat> and it goes like this. So we start from this picture where we have no net magnetization, and as we said, it uh, corresponds to a no spin order in the uh, reciprocal momentum space of our energy bands. <clears throat> and we said that no net magnetization is favorable, so we want to keep it. So uh, on this cartoon, I'm going to show you that we can keep the uh, uh, zero net magnetization, and we somehow will bring the spin order uh, into life. And it's done like this. So as you say, I am turning my uh, uh, spin degenerate, no spin polarization Fermi surfaces into well-defined spin up and spin down channels, <coughs> which have the same volume. So I have perfect compensation. I have zero net magnetization. However, as you see, I developed a, a well-separated and well-defined spin-up and spin-down channels. <clears throat> so I now do have the spin order in the reciprocal space. And let's quickly see on this cartoon level whether this could indeed solve our problem, whether we can start to see the type of phenomena that we are used to in ferromagnetic spintronics, uh, and uh, uh, in particular the ones uh, that are used in the devices. Before I get to uh, giant magneto resistance and, and spin torque, let me start with uh, anomalous Hall effect and uh, its uh, optical or thermal counterparts, because these phenomena can be measured in simple films and are sort of the hallmark uh, 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 time reversal symmetry breaking phenomena known in ferromagnetic spintronics. <clears throat> so uh, in ferromagnets, uh, we know why we can observe anomalous Hall effect and the, uh, the counterpart Faraday curve and Nernst effect. And this is because we have uh, broken time reversal symmetry. And uh, it's a strong non-relativistic uh, effect here. And when I say non-relativistic, what I mean here, uh, my spin space and my momentum space are independent. I can rotate the spin axis uh, whichever way with respect to the axis of the momentum space, and nothing changes because I live in the, uh, um, in the non-relativistic uh, world, uh, which is the world uh, when we have the strong uh, contributions to magnetism like exchange uh, uh, coupling, etc. <clears throat> so uh, the two spaces, spin space and uh, the physical space, are not coupled. And this is, for example, the case of Schrodinger equation or Pauli equation description of, uh, of magnetism. <clears throat> and so, uh, as you see, we have uh, clearly broken time reversal symmetry because uh, when we do time reversal, we flip the spins and you see that the picture changes. So this is the necessary condition to observe uh, anomalous Hall effect. And when you look at our anomalous, uh, at our uh, uh, unconventional uh, uh, magnetic phase here, you see that we have the same effect. When we uh, do the time reversal operation, we flip the spins, you see that the band structure changes, just like in the ferromagnetic case. So we do have this necessary condition. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, we also know in ferromagnets that there has to be one uh, symmetry, additional symmetry broken in collinear magnets, and that's a time reversal operation combined with the spin rotation. So you time reverse and then you just rotate the spin space independently uh, and uh, you need to break the symmetry. So the safest way how to break that symmetry is not to allow for independent operations in the spin space, and that is done when you include relativistic spin orbit coupling effects. Because at that time, spin space and the real physical space, the momentum space, they become coupled, so you cannot make independent rotations of the spin space. So uh, adding relativistic effect is the safe way how to remove uh, the symmetry, and that's necessary also to observe uh, the anomalous Hall effect. The same applies to this unconventional phase. If you want to observe the anomalous Hall effect, you also break, have to break this uh, symmetry because these are also collinear systems and uh, relativistic effects will do it for you. <clears throat> but we also said that relativistic effects are typically weak corrections compared to the non-relativistic strong exchange physics. And this is the reason why these phenomena typically are relatively weak, and one of the reasons why they are used in labs very frequently, but not in commercial devices. <clears throat> we know that in commercial devices, uh, uh, we rely on the giant magnetoresistance, spin torque, tunneling magnetoresistance, et cetera, and those effects only require the strong, non-relativistic broken uh, <clears throat> time uh, reversal symmetry. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, all these effects, basically rely, and as we showed on the cartoon on the first slides, uh, that we can generate spin polarized currents. <clears throat> and uh, as you see in a ferromagnet, we can understand it very easily in a simple Druda picture. When you apply electric field, you will generate uh, an axis of uh, carriers moving uh, towards my left, towards your right here. And as you see from this model representation, there's gonna be many more spin up uh, electrons generated than spin down electron generated uh, to your right, so that the electrical current will be also spin polarized. <clears throat> now, can we have the same effect in our unconventional uh, phase? And here you see that yes, if I apply electrical current, I will generate many more spin up uh, electrons than the spin down electrons, very much the same as in the ferromagnetic case. And this is despite the fact that in equilibrium, I have the same number of spin up and spin down electrons. <clears throat> So uh, what do we have here? Uh, we can have uh, 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 phenomena uh, like spin polarized current, giant magnetoresistance, et cetera, <coughs> uh, which are non-relativistic in principle, so they are strong, but in this unconventional phase, they can exist uh, uh, simultaneously with having no net equilibrium magnetization in the system, so working with compensated magnets. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, if you have this longitudinal spin polarized current, you can start thinking of building uh, ordinary giant magnetoresistance on tunneling magnetoresistance devices where you would have uh, lower resistance in case of a parallel configuration of this staggered order and anti-parallel configuration will, will give you a high resistance just because of the fact that you have spin dependent conductivities or spin dependent currents in your system. So this is perfectly analogous to ferromagnets. But I also want to highlight to you that because we have this unconventional phase, we can also do many more things. We can have a richer phenomenology uh, that is not achievable in ferromagnets. And the example is that the only thing that I change from this cartoon to this one is that I rotate the applied electric field by 45 degrees. <clears throat> and now in this case, what happens is that uh, the spin up currents uh, and the spin down currents will have the same magnitude but they will propagate at different angles. So basically by applying uh, electric field, you will split electrons by their spins in a way that in the longitudinal direction, the current will be unpolarized, but you will have a pure spin current in the transverse direction. <clears throat> and again, this is a phenomenon that uh, can be realized in systems which in equilibrium have zero net magnetization are compensated. And it's a phenomenon which is uh, non-relativistic. So principally can be very strong. <clears throat> And in terms of devices, you can think of a device when you apply electrical bias longitudinal and you will have a transfer spin current injecting into the other electrode. So it's analogous geometry to the relativistic spin orbit torque using a spin hole effect, for example. But now you have a phenomenon which is non-relativistic. And when you calculate the efficiencies of these effects, uh, they can be easily orders of magnitude stronger than uh, all the relativistic counterparts. So hoping that uh, uh, on this uh, cartoon level, I convinced you that with this unconventional phase, you can now 
solve the problem. Uh, <coughs> you can have the same type of phenomena that uh, ferromagnetic spintronics is based on, but maybe you can have also additional phenomena or a richer phenomenology. Uh, let me now move on to the systematic uh, general understanding of this phase, where it can appear in what type of materials and what's the, uh, how we describe their behavior. <coughs> And uh, uh, when I go into that direction, into the general understanding, uh, let me just highlight uh, one thing. It's been not only uh, a research over the past five or plus years in the antiferromagnetic spintronic community that was going into this direction, trying to think how we solve this principal problem of antiferromagnets. Remarkably, more than a decade ago, a completely different community of people was actually speculating about a possibility of having such an unconventional magnetic phase, and that was the uh, community, the traditional community in condensed matter uh, in magnetism and superconductivity. And how did they come up with the concept, which uh, in that community was not physically realized in a real material, but it was an idea uh, uh, that uh, uh, people were speculating. And it was based on the analogy between magnetism and superconductivity, which was one of the strongest and most important analogies in, condensed, in many body condensed matter physics. <clears throat> and the analogy is that when you look at uh, conventional magnetism, uh, represented by a cartoon of a conventional ferromagnet, what you have is a spin polarization or the parameter. So basically, you have a spin up electron at your Fermi surface, and there is a missing spin down electron, so there is a spin down hole uh, at the Fermi surface. Now, in a superconducting material, what happens at the Fermi surface is that you have a Cooper pair for the parameter, and that's an order parameter of spin up electron with a spin uh, down electron in this case. <clears throat> and the conventional S wave superconductivity has this Cooper pair order parameter, which is principally isotropic around the Fermi surface, and ferromagnets have the spin polarization order parameter, which is principally isotropic around the Fermi surface, and that's the reason why people call it S wave symmetry. <clears throat> But you know, in superconductivity, the big breakthrough was the discovery of unconventional uh, superconductivity of the D-wave symmetry, in which case the order parameter and its phase, in particular, changes sign when you go around the Fermi surface between uh, 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 these, uh, in this D-wave uh, symmetry fashion. Now, in uh, superconductivity, we have real physical realization. That's, for example, the cuprate high temperature superconductors. But until today, the, uh, the, the microscopic mechanism of the superconductivity is still not fully understood. It's been understood that it must be connected with some strong correlations, <coughs> but precisely it is not known. But when people in this community were looking at these cartoons, they say, ah, there must be something analogous also on the magnetic uh, uh, side of things that you might be also able to uh, realize this unconventional D-wave magnetism in which the order parameter, which is a spin polarization or the parameter, will flip sign when you go around the Fermi surface. <clears throat> but because they were focused on strongly correlated systems on very delicate phases, maybe this could be the reason why they couldn't find a real physical uh, realization of this. <clears throat> but uh, we have now many systems, and so let me just show uh, the way how we can arrive systematically and generally into realizing this unconventional phase in a broad family of materials. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when I want to do this, uh, the first question I need to ask is, learning from the lesson in the past, should we then, when we try to develop a general understanding, should we then consider this unconventional magnets as a subclass of antiferromagnets? So basically, should we start from the no net magnetization and then somehow think how materials can turn on the spin order in the reciprocal space. So is this the correct picture that we need to keep in mind to develop the general understanding? Or should we rather learn from uh, the magnetism and superconductivity community who are telling us that you know, they start from an ordinary S-wave ferromagnet, there is a spin order in the reciprocal space, and what they are saying is that there might be a way how you can actually turn the presence of the net magnetization into its absence. So basically turn off the magnetization. So it would be pictured like this. So now we can vote who prefers that approach or who prefers the, the other approach, subclass of antiferromagnets, subclass of ferromagnets. It's very important. It's a conceptual question. And uh, the answer that we have, and it's this answer which is based on a uh, on the most fundamental tool in physics to uh, describe and classify phases and its symmetry, 
So I'm going to show you that neither is correct. It's not a subclass of antiferromagnets. This unconventional phase is not a subclass of uh, ferromagnets. It's actually a completely independent phase, which is exclusively distinct by symmetry from uh, ferromagnets and antiferromagnets. So uh, uh, let me just uh, walk you through this now. And uh, <coughs> because, uh, <coughs> Uh, to be honest, for me, uh, thinking about phases just from the fundamental symmetry principles was not very easy. Uh, I had to take a lot of time for me to become uh, comfortable with these uh, concepts. I will also do it today in a, in a slow, step-by-step -step, uh, fashion. And I will start from the very familiar uh, case of the distinction between a paramagnetic and ferromagnetic phase. So by symmetry, how do we distinguish these two phases? <coughs> So uh, first of all, let me characterize them. What are the key characteristics? So paramagnets have no spin order in the direct space. So at any position in the direct space, there is no net spin. Uh, the spin averages to zero at every point in the real space. Now, as a result, obviously, there is no net magnetization. And as a result, there is also no spin order in the reciprocal momentum space in the energy spectrum. What symmetry is actually uh, protecting uh, the absence of the spin order in the real and uh, reciprocal space. The symmetry is spin rotation. It's the rotation of spins in the spin space. You can rotate the spin space whichever way, way you want. This picture wouldn't change. It wouldn't change because you don't see the spins, because the spins are absent. <laughs> now, in ferromagnets, in contrast, what you have is that you have spin order in the direct space. You have net magnetization for the ferromagnetic order. And you have also the counterpart spin order in the reciprocal space. <clears throat> now, because now you do have the order, some symmetry has to be broken. And the key symmetry that is broken uh, in ferromagnets is the spin rotation symmetry. Uh, we can see that if I rotate the spin space, the picture changes. If I rotate the spin space back, again, the picture changes. Uh, you probably didn't notice, but I was also rotating the spin space in the paramagnet. But because you didn't see the changes, that means that the paramagnet is invariant under this transformation, while the ferromagnet isn't. <clears throat> so uh, let's move on uh, to, uh, to the next one. But before, uh, let me just highlight that because we have this uh, spin order in both spin and reciprocal space, this is the reason why I can extract spin polarized current from my ferromagnetic lattice. And it's basically isotropic. Whichever way I apply the bias, I will still extract principally the same uh, spin uh, polarization. <clears throat> so let me move on to anti-ferromagnets. <clears throat> they do have the staggered uh, spin order in the direct space, but they have no net magnetization, and there is no counterpart spin order in the reciprocal space. So first of all, the presence of the spin order has to be due to some broken symmetry. Uh, it's no surprise, it's again the broken spin rotation symmetry that we have in anti-ferromagnets. On the other hand, the absence of net magnetization of the spin order in the reciprocal space must be protected by some sort of a symmetry in the system, which is not present in ferromagnets. And the symmetry is uh, a combined operation of 180 degree spin rotation. So you rotate the spin space by 180 degrees, and then you do crystal translation by half unit cell, or you do inversion of the crystal around the center between the two uh, opposite spin sublattices. So that would recover identical state. So uh, this is a symmetry. So the presence of this symmetry guarantees no net magnetization and no spin order in the reciprocal space. And as you see, no such symmetry uh, is present in ferromagnets. So these two phases are exclusively distinct. There is no overlap in this non-relativistic picture of magnetism between ferromagnets and antiferromagnets. <laughs> And because of this symmetry, uh, when you try to get uh, electrical current uh, from an antiferromagnet, you will always get both spins up and downs. So uh, the net uh, spin polarization will be zero. And again, this will be isotropic in principle. So let's now move to the uh, <coughs> unconventional phase. <coughs> so uh, what happens in the unconventional phase? We have spin order in the direct space. We have no net magnetization, but we do have the counterpart spin order in the reciprocal space here. <clears throat> so uh, spin order, broken symmetry, again, the same spin rotation symmetry. No net magnetization. That means there has to be some symmetry that protects the zero net magnetization. 
and the symmetry is now 180 degree spin rotation, so it's a rotation in the independent spin space by 180 degrees, combined now with a crystal rotation transformation. As you see now that the electron densities that represent the spin down and the electron densities that represent the spin up are anisotropic, and the anisotropy axes here are mutually rotated, for example, by 90 degrees in this case. And that results in the fact that there is a rotation, crystal rotation symmetry that connects the two sublattices. But simultaneously, you have to have spin order in the reciprocal space, so you have to break some symmetries. And the symmetries that you break here is the 180 degree spin rotation combined with the translation or inversion. That was the symmetry that in the antiferromagnets uh, resulted in the no spin order in the reciprocal space. That symmetry is broken. I, do, I cannot just translate and, and reorient the spins and get the same state because of this anisotropic electron densities representing the spin up and spin down, the collinear spin up and spin down states here. Now, because of this anisotropy, I now get this uh, remarkable property. When I apply electrical bias, I can now extract spins primarily from one sublattice when I apply the bias along one direction. So if I apply the bias along horizontal direction, I will primarily extract spin up electrons. Now when I apply the bias in the orthogonal direction, I will primarily extract the spin down electrons. <laughs> so that shows you both that you can operate these materials as ferromagnets, but simultaneously you have automatically a richer phenomenology that is not present in the principally isotropic uh, ferromagnets. So this is a concept. It's a very general concept. It's based on general principles of classifying and describing phases. And uh, again, you see that there is no overlap between this unconventional phase and the antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic because the symmetry conditions are all mutually exclusive. <clears throat> Uh, so be because it's distinct, let me just give this uh, unconventional phase a certain name. And because the characteristic feature of this phase is that I have alternating spin polarization in the direct space, I have the counterpart alternating spin polarization connected with the same rotation symmetry in the reciprocal space. I have the alternating uh, sign of the uh, uh, spin polarization of the current I can get from these materials. Let me just call them alter magnets. <clears throat> And uh, with the principle at hand, which is based on symmetry, the very fundamental and general principle, this gives me a very strong uh, tool that I can now start searching uh, materials databases uh, and see uh, whether I can realize this concept in real physical material. <clears throat> and so now I will go through a few uh, representative materials and show you uh, that uh, you can have uh, a real physical realization uh, of this ultramagnetic phase and also give you some hints about its strength. So uh, the first example is a rutile crystal. <clears throat> well, at least to us, this was probably the biggest surprise. Because when you open textbooks on anti-ferromagnetism, when you open old uh, papers of Louis Nail when he was presenting uh, his discovery of anti-ferromagnets, rutiles would be his type of crystals where he would demonstrate all the key features of antiferromagnets. When you look up these papers, what you see, however, that uh, what is plotted is only the lattice of the magnetic atoms in the rutile. So if I only put in the picture the magnetic atoms, they indeed fulfill the necessary and sufficient conditions for having the antiferromagnetic phase with no spin polarization or the parameter in the reciprocal momentum space. And this is because these two sublattices are connected by translation and inversion. <clears throat> but remarkably, the picture changes completely when I include in the picture the non-magnetic oxygen or fluoride atoms that are present in these uh, rutile crystals. <clears throat> when you look at it now, you have absence of the translation or inversion symmetry connecting the opposite sublattices, but you still have a symmetry that connects them, and that's the crystal rotation operation. So the remarkable thing is, that the type of magnetic phase that you have in these rutiles is actually dictated uh, by the non-magnetic atoms and their positions in the crystal, which is something that uh, uh, is clearly counterintuitive. <clears throat> and it could have been the reason why this phase has been missed for so many decades. Now, if, 
the, the next question, okay, so is it a, a very delicate, subtle thing? Like when people were thinking in context of high temperature superconductivity going to very strongly correlated systems, quantum phase transitions, they typically talk about zero temperature effects, something very subtle. So how strong is this ultramagnetism, this unconventional uh, 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 magnetic phase when it's realized through this uh, uh, crystal uh, potentials of the magnetic and non-magnetic atoms. So we can see when we do DFT calculations and the representative root tau is ruthenium dioxide here. Why is it uh, uh, favorable for us? Because it's metallic. That's quite exceptional among root tiles. Uh, so you can uh, think of spintronic devices operated electrically. And it also has uh, 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 this uh, compensated antiparallel order uh, well above room temperature. <clears throat> So when you do the DFT calculation, so first let's look at the momentum space, at the reciprocal space, the, uh, uh, the cuts of the Fermi surfaces, and you see that they are perfectly well uh, separated, spin up and spin down channels. And indeed, uh, they are connected by this mutual 90 degree rotation. So this is a real physical uh, realization of the D wave uh, magnetism, unconventional magnetism. Now, <clears throat> how strong it is, uh, uh, it's best to look into the spectrum and see how large in energy is the splitting between the spin up and spin down channels. And what you see here that the splitting can be on the order of electron volt. So that is comparable to the spin splittings in ferromagnets. So in principle, uh, uh, the phase is as robust as, uh, uh, as the conventional ferromagnetic phase. And uh, <coughs> this, uh, because it's metallic, uh, it's been also the first material where we try to not only predict theoretically the anomalous Hall effect, but also to detect it experimentally. So now indeed we have an experimental demonstration with our colleagues uh, in Beijing uh, that uh, there is an anomalous Hall effect which is of comparable strength to conventional uh, ferromagnets. And there was a discussion yesterday also that you know, it's very important to have materials. If you want to think about future applications, materials that are not really very obscure, that are materials that are based on type of crystals that are common uh, in present electronics. So here I'd like to emphasize that root tiles, uh, magnetic root tiles, are actually the, the brother materials of very common uh, dielectrics like silicon oxide, hafnium oxide, titanium oxides. They can crystallize in the same structure as uh, ruthenium as the magnetic root tiles here. And that also tells us that we can grow ruthenium dioxide very nicely on titanium dioxide. And that was one of the things that allowed us to uh, uh, clearly demonstrate the anomalous Hall effect because we had very high quality films on titanium dioxide. <clears throat> Next surprise to us. You go through, uh, you, you now have exactly the picture what you're looking for, what type of symmetries, typically this rotated uh, oxygen octahedra around the magnetic atom and the next one is a classic antiferromagnetic parent crystal of high temperature superconductivity, uh, this perovskite cuprate. <clears throat> so again, what you see here, because these uh, oxygen cages are mutually rotated, there is no translation or inversion symmetry connecting the opposite spin sublattices, but there is a rotation symmetry. So this is now the three-dimensional picture of the Fermi surface, and again, you see that you have these two nodal planes, and you have the D-wave uh, <clears throat> unconventional magnetism or D-wave ultramagnetism in this uh, crystal. Now again, we were wondering how is it possible? I mean, cuprates have been studied for uh, several decades and nobody reported spin splitting and this type of phase and, and it's been always considered to be a spin degenerate antiferromagnet. <clears throat> so one, uh, uh, to us, possible explanation we found in this recent review on ARPES, angle resolved photo emission uh, experiments combined with DFT calculations, where there's a whole chapter on this cuprate. And what you see is figures uh, or pictures where people are looking at the spectra and typically what you do in ARPES on NDFT calculus is you look at high symmetry planes. So there's been a lot of studies at the high symmetry planes, which is the KZ equals zero plane uh, in your uh, uh, brilliant zone here. But you see the KZ equals zero plane by symmetry is spin degenerate. So you would not notice the spin splitting if you look at these high symmetry planes. And there always have to be degenerate planes in ultramagnets because you have to have equal number of brilliant zones split with one sign and other part of the Boolean zone with opposite sign. <clears throat> uh, so uh, to us, uh, this opens an interesting area. We can think of two things. For example, first of all, coexistence of unconventional D-wave superconductivity and unconventional D-wave magnetism, and potentially, that would be obviously more interesting, 
a potential interplay between uh, those two order parameters, maybe one enabling the other. <clears throat> now, uh, so far I was talking about oxides, and indeed, uh, when we scan the databases, you will see that many of these altered magnets are oxides, but this is to highlight that uh, it's not only oxides. So it's example of, uh, again, if you go to literature of uh, chalcogenite or nictite materials, which were referred to as classic antiferromagnetic semiconductor and metal, manganese telluride, chromium and timony, simple binary compounds. <coughs> manganese telluride being a, a, a conventional uh, or, or prototypical uh, semiconductor with the compensated order, and chromium and timony, a prototypical metal with the compensated order, uh, and with both with uh, nail temperatures above room temperature. In particular, chromium and timony has 700K uh, nail temperature. Now, when you look at their crystal structure, you again recognize the same pattern. Uh, the two opposite spin sublattices are not connected by translation or inversion. They are connected by rotation, and that implies uh, that they are ultramagnet. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, when you look at their uh, crystal structure from the top here, you see that th there is also this hexagonal pattern. So that symmetry actually generates that you do not have only two nodal surfaces. You have three nodal surfaces along one axis, and then you have a fourth nodal surface, which is orthogonal to that surface. So in terms of the partial wave uh, expansion, you now go from a D wave into a G wave type of unconventional magnetism. So uh, that's something I'm not aware of uh, the superconducting community envisaging this. But once you have the symmetry-based general classification, the description of this phase, you will uh, immediately run into higher order even parity wave type of magnets, in particular the G-wave one. <clears throat> uh, so these were examples uh, which maybe were not extensively discussed at this workshop, but let me now finish uh, when going through the materials with two examples which I saw uh, even yesterday uh, that they were considered uh, <clears throat> uh, at this workshop. So uh, the first example is uh, uh, the material uh, that was uh, uh, explored in Alexis and, and, and Ubert's uh, uh, recent paper on the fantastic uh, low energy ultra fast switching of a compensated magnet. But uh, as you see, the same orthophorides were used already more than uh, a decade and a half ago uh, when all this field of uh, ultra fast uh, photomagnetism started in Nijmegen. <clears throat> now, uh, indeed, when you just look at the uh, at the uh, magnetic atoms here, they have this anti-parallel order, compensated anti-parallel order. But when you uh, plot the full crystal lattice of these orthophorides, you again recognize these oxygen cages uh, which have a mutual rotation. So again, uh, uh, this is the characteristic signature of having an ultramagnetic phase uh, in which you will have all the features that I uh, described to you before. <clears throat> So one thing that I want to highlight in particular here in the context of these studies is that very often you use uh, not a Hall effect because they tend to be insulating, but you use a Faraday uh, magneto-optical effect, which is the AC counterpart of the anomalous Hall effect, to probe uh, the dynamics of, uh, of these uh, magnets. And what I'm trying to highlight here is that the anomalous Hall effect, Faraday effect, Nernst effect, in altered magnets, they are governed, they originate, they arise from the compensated uh, magnetic, anti-parallel magnetic order, for, from the time reversal symmetry breaking by the compensated order. So <clears throat> even with negligible or non-existing, unmeasurable uh, net magnetization in the system, you can still have these phenomena, Faraday effect, anomalous Hall effect, of comparable magnitude or even larger magnitude that in conventional ferromagnets with huge magnetization. <clears throat> the other material uh, that's been discussed uh, yesterday uh, uh, is hematite. <clears throat> and again, when you look at the collegiate phase of hematite and you look at the surrounding uh, oxygen cages, you recognize the same feature, the mutual rotation of these cages, and that again gives you uh, 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 the ultra-magnetic phase. And uh, it has a uh, a very similar crystal structure to the manganese telluride or chromium antimony. So again, you will arrive at the, uh, at the G wave uh, type of order. While I didn't uh, emphasize that this one, this orthophorite, is more like the ruthenium dioxide, uh, it's the D wave, or the, the cuprate is the D wave. So uh, <coughs> uh, the studies uh, in this orthophorite, the fantastic work, was using a single terahertz photon to switch uh, this material. 
But here uh, on this slide, I'd like to emphasize one thing that, you know, you can think not only about a photon, uh, terahertz photon quasiparticle, but you can also think of terahertz magnon uh, quasiparticle. And uh, the question is what type of magnons we can expect in these systems. <clears throat> you know that uh, compensated uh, magnets have very interesting feature in magnonic spectrum compared to ferromagnets, and that's the linear dispersion. So magnons in compensated magnets behave more like photons uh, uh, because of this linear dispersion, and that's a feature that allows you, for example, to generate, in principle, ultra-short magnonic pulses and then propagate them in a similar fashion to, uh, to photons because you have momentum-independent group velocity. <clears throat> So we know that from, uh, from uh, antiferromagnets, but what happens in these ultramagnets? So uh, this is just a cartoon. It's not a real calculation for the, uh, for the hematite. We have real calculation for uh, the ruthenium dioxide, uh, where this cartoon is perfectly uh, applicable. And what we see here is that now we also have linear dispersion. That's analogous to conventional antiferromagnets, but we have splitting of, uh, of the magnon spectrum uh, by the chirality of the magnon. So in some sense, uh, they become a mixture of the antiferromagnetic type of spectrum and the ferromagnetic spectrum where we also have chiral magnons here. Of course, it's an ultramagnet. So if in one part of the Brillouin zone of the magnon spectrum you have one sign of splitting, there has to be another part in the Brillouin zone where the sign of the splitting uh, changes. So the, polar, the chirality of the magnon will be very anisotropic, will change uh, depending on the propagation, uh, on the wave vector of, uh, of the magnon. So uh, <clears throat> this was an excursion over uh, <clears throat> a few selected uh, materials. And uh, so let me now conclude with uh, a few general remarks. <clears throat> so first of all, we already uh, noticed uh, that we had uh, D wave type and we had also G wave type, where what I plot here is a Brillouin zone and the uh, spin degenerate nodal planes in the Brillouin zone here. And as I said, we can have two spin degenerate nodal planes, that would be D wave. We can have four, uh, that would be the G wave. But by uh, a complete systematic symmetry analysis of all possibilities that you have in collinear ultramagnets, you realize that there is another possibility that you have six nodal planes. Uh, uh, that are spin degenerate and they cross the gamma point. And that in the uh, notation of the partial uh, even parity waves would be an I wave. <clears throat> so uh, uh, if you are able to systematically classify uh, all ultramagnets by these spin symmetry groups, then you will realize that for each uh, symmetry group, you will just from the symmetries present in the group, you can uh, uh, precisely identify what type of unconventional magnetism such a uh, crystal structure and spin structure can host. <clears throat> now, uh, this could look like an academic exercise. I have a full systematic rigorous classification uh, of the symmetry groups and the corresponding nodal planes, but it actually can have very important consequences for observables. <clears throat> and just one example, Anomalous Hall effect or tunneling magneto resistance principally can exist in any type of ultramagnet, uh, D, IG, or I wave. But this is not the case for the spin dependent conductivity. Uh, so the spin dependent conductivity, and if you think of GMR based on spin dependent conductivities, these are present by symmetry only in the D wave, while uh, the G wave and I have, have too many nodal planes, spin degenerate nodal planes, that by symmetry actually excludes this. So uh, when you think of observables, not all ultramagnets will behave identically, and that's the reason why it's very important to fully understand their symmetry and have a rigorous and systematic symmetry description. So uh, on, at the bottom of this slide, let me just not go through uh, the, the systematic derivation of the spin groups of ultramagnets, but just give you a flavor of the basic structure of the spin groups <clears throat> and how you do this. So you start from the real space crystallography group, let's call it G, and when you construct an ultramagnetic spin group, you do uh, uh, two operations. First operation is that you split all the transformations that are in this crystallography group in two parts. One half of transformation will go to this halving subgroup H, and the second half of transformation will go into the remaining part of the group, which is just the G minus H. So you split the transformation into two halves. And then, 
uh, this second half has to contain only rotation transformation. Okay? So that already tells you that not all crystallographic groups actually allow you to do this type of splitting. So not all crystals, non-magnetic crystals, in principle are allowed to host the ultramagnetic phase. But majority do. In majority cases, you are able to split the non-magnetic uh, crystallographic group into these parts when the second part contains only rotation. And now the corresponding spin group looks like this. You combine this halving subgroup with an identity in the spin space, so basically no operation in spin space, while the second part, the part of transformations which are rotation in the real space, that you connect with the spin space 180 degree rotation. And this is the construction of your spin groups. And you see that this part, these symmetries, describe the opposite spin sublattice symmetries, the symmetries that connect opposite spin sublattices, while these symmetries are the symmetries within each spin sublattice here. And uh, once you know these symmetries, you can derive all the properties of the electronic structure, but also of the observables that you are interested in. So uh, that brings me to the uh, uh, summary slide of, uh, uh, of this uh, classification, where uh, this is a list of all crystallographic, now I, just to make the list small and fit in one page, I'm listing the Lauer groups. Uh, uh, you can expand this into point groups or space groups if you want. <coughs> so these are all the allowed uh, uh, Lauer groups, crystallographic Lauer groups uh, that can host the antiferromagnetic, the ultramagnetic phase. And these are the corresponding uh, uh, spin groups. <coughs> so uh, you have a complete classification for all collinear ultramagnets. There is no other group allowed, at least uh, uh, to, our, to the best of our knowledge. And then with this toolbox, you can scan the material databases and you can start discovering more and more and more materials every day. Uh, this is really changing, it's the dynamic. Uh, uh, Libor uh, Schmeichel is working on this every day. Uh, today he told me that he has 200 uh, materials. But what is uh, <coughs> uh, um, important is this comparison to, uh, with the same database uh, uh, between these three different phases. So antiferromagnets, they still rule. I mean, they are still the most abundant, but ultramagnets surprisingly seem to be more abundant than ferromagnets. So this is not uh, a rare example. There is many materials, and as I said, at the moment we have 200. And among those, there are insulating, semiconducting, semi-metallic, metallic, superconducting, various crystal structure, uh, chemistry types, and you can have uh, ultramagnetism in 3D, but also in 2D crystals. <clears throat> so all this, uh, from all this, you can start think that uh, Ultramagnetism is not only useful for uh, spintronics, terahertz, uh, or optics, or neuromorphics, magnonics, but there are many other fields where ultramagnets can be useful because you have all these different types of conduction, uh, chemistry, or, uh, or uh, crystal structure. And obviously, you can also think of topology because you have not only 3D, but also uh, 2D materials. So I think I should leave some time also for discussion. So thank you very much for your attention.